thank you to the organizers for having me. Thank you for the warriors who made it all the way to Friday afternoon. I appreciate it. Um, okay, so perhaps um, just a little a brief bit about my background because I think at interdisciplinary conferences it's useful to know uh, where your speaker is coming from. I started life uh, mostly in physics with a little bit of social science on the side. Um, I then worked in, uh, in energy systems development for some years, um, and that's when I got interested in complex systems, particularly multi-scale analysis of complex systems. And then I moved into uh, social ecological systems modeling at Stockholm Resilience Center. And uh, I, I went to Stockholm Resilience Center to deal with the issue of multi-scale dynamics, so that the global social ecological system displays uh, dynamics over a vast range of spatial and temporal scales, with, of course, mind-blowing complexity. And it's increasingly clear that we, we can't ignore uh, the interactions between dynamics at different scales when we're, when we're dealing with issues of sustainability. Uh, so whereas it might be tempting to think that you can just study a, a system at the level of uh, a local community or a country or the, or the, whole, the world as a whole, um, the, the point of the work that I'll be showing today is to consider interactions between those things. And uh, <clears throat> I like this picture as a... An, an image that captures the kind of challenge that we're dealing with. So the repeated motif uh, is, is one of many interacting uh, agents within a, a complex system giving rise to emergent large-scale behavior which then feeds back onto the agents at uh, the smaller scale. And one uh, encounters very interesting questions like under what conditions can can some, uh, just one or some small subgroup of those agents have strong control over the whole system? Um, and how can we leverage those kinds of effects to uh, manage the system? So I'll, I'll talk in uh, three parts today. I'll present um, first some, uh, some now old work, which will be the basis for the new work that I'll show you. So I'll, I'll show you a stylized model of a, a social ecological system, and you, you'll see that there's, there's quite some complementarity between what I show in detail and what um, Jonathan nicely showed uh, in, a, in a more broad picture. I'll then talk about uh, extending that model into a, a multi-scale analysis. And then finally, some, uh, discuss some foundational issues with you that I encountered, uh, that I struggled with while, while working on these models. Uh, the work, the, all the, the technical work that I present today is, um, is contained in this paper, which we published just a few weeks back. Um, and this is work that was done with Steve Laid and uh, Maya Schluter when I was in Maya's group at the Resilience Center. Um, if your interest is piqued by this work, I encourage you to check out um, her group's website at seslink.org, and the Resilience Center has, a, has its own website with a, a very active communication channel at stockholmresilience.org. Okay, so now the, the, the point here is not to uh, do a, a very detailed uh, Earth system model with a, a huge number of parameters. Um, and there are, of course, many nice models like that, and we've seen some this week. Um, coming from a theoretical physics background, I'm more partial to trying to uh, uh, understand as much as possible using relatively simple models. Of course, um, we acknowledge that these are Im imperfect models, but the idea is to, to understand the, the key features of reality which can be uh, captured in, in just a, a relatively simple description. So what we have here is a, a multi-level system with, with two layers. There's a social layer and a biophysical layer, and there are there are social interactions within the social layer, biophysical interactions within the biophysical layer, and then interactions between the two. And of particular interest here is that we, we have this hierarchical structure where if you look right over on the left, there's a, a resource, in this case an aquifer, a water resource. Um, and the, the, the processes that, that uh, relate the, that, that determine the, the water level in that local resource um, are all strongly coupled to each other, uh, as are the social interactions within the small community that's harvesting that, that region of the aquifer. But it's also coupled through the, the, the groundwater um, hydraulics to other uh, aquifers in the biophysical layer, and there's weak and very weak social coupling to other communities. And we're interested in uh, trying to describe uh, how those weak and very weak interactions can affect uh, the um, interactions within the strong local community, which we might otherwise assume to be independent from those weak interactions. So we'll show you in detail a model that describes a, just a pair of these systems, like so. And we will see that despite weak couplings between these subsystems, subsystem two can induce critical transitions in subsystem one, so they are strongly mutually dependent. Um, when the coupling is only biophysical, uh, subsystem two can induce collapse of cooperation, and by cooperation I mean cooperation with a social norm of sustainable behavior. Uh, but when, you, when we add social interaction between the two systems, 
we can prevent that collapse and in fact uh, everything turns out in a much more rosy picture. And the take home message will be that local sustainability can promote or prevent sustainability at larger scales. So we have this adage in, uh, in sustainability that we should think global and act local. But when, when one caches out the complexity in a model, we see that that's, that picture is too simplistic. And that if we want to think global and act local, we at least have to also think about how we're interacting with other communities uh, to which we are coupled. So let's just consider one of these subsystems to begin with. This is work that was presented in 2012 by, uh, by, by Maya, who I told you about before, with uh, Alessandro Tavoni and Simon Levin. Uh, so we, we have a common pool resource. So this is a resource that's freely accessible. Um, and it's a renewable resource, so it's being replenished by the environment. It's also losing some, uh, some resource to the environment. And then there's a community that's extracting resource. And that community is made up of, of agents who can choose to cooperate with or defect from a norm of sustainable behavior, as I'll explain in detail. The resource dynamics are taken from um, an emp uh, empirical uh, knowledge of, uh, of groundwater resources. So that the first term on the left there, that C, that's a constant replenishment rate. The middle term is a, is a loss rate. Um, D is, is just some parameter of the system. And then we see the quadratic dependence on the resource occupation. So the big R there is, that's how much resource there is in the aquifer. You can just think of it like a, like a bucket. That's how full the bucket is. And RM is the maximum resource level. It's the capacity of the bucket. And the final term is the extraction term, where Q represents the, the level of technology that, that the community has for extracting resource. E is the resource effort, or is the extraction effort that they apply, and R is the resource level. So the total amount of resource that they're able to extract depends on how much technology they have to do so, how hard they work, and how much resource there is. Then, uh, this is a, a Cobb-Douglas production function, which will be familiar to the uh, economists among us. Uh, this just basically tells you how much value that they get from the resource that they extract. And it depends on both how hard they work um, and, uh, and how much resource there is. These are the factors of production in this model. We assume a uniform disaggregation of the community effort among the agents in the system. So the total community effort is the sum of all the individual efforts and we assume they're all the same. So N there is the number of agents in the, in the community. And this pi here, this is the, the payoff that they get for their harvesting strategy. What this, what this means is um, for a given agent applying effort small e, they get this amount of value out of the, uh, the, the, the resource that they extract. Um, and it's fairly intuitive, it just says that um, they get their fair share of the production, but also they have to pay a cost, and that's the W, that's the cost of, uh, cost of productive effort. So when you go and do some work to extract something, you have to, have to pay some money for it. Now, we assume that there are two different harvesting strategies. This is, this is because our social uh, model is described using evolutionary game theory. Um, we use a, a two-strategy model uh, where the cooperators uh, constrain themselves to what they have uh, deemed to be a socially optimal level of harvesting. So this, this level is in practice determined through a, a resource economics calculation. But um, notionally, one can imagine a community that's familiar with the resource that they're harvesting, um, uh, b being somewhat aware of, of, over time, how much they can roughly afford to extract. And so they all agree, all right, none of us are going to overharvest. We're all going to um, be nice. But of course, everyone is individually incentivized to overharvest. Um, which can lead to the, the so-called tragedy of the commons, which is a, a fairly well-known um, idea in, uh, in sustainability. Uh, so when people are incentivized to over-harvest, uh, and, and when they choose to make that choice, uh, they, uh, we call them defectors, and when they uh, conform to the norm, we call them cooperators. And we, you can see this mu, this mu parameter here, that's the ratio of the cooperative effort to the defective effort, and we assume that if somebody's defecting from the norm, they're, they're harvesting more, they're applying more harvesting effort than the cooperators. So therefore the total community extractive effort is the sum of how many cooperators there are times how hard they each work, plus the effort that all the defectors apply and how many of them there are. And we can represent this as follows. The interesting uh, variable here is the phi right at the end. That is the fraction of the population which is cooperative. So we, we now approximate um, the uh, cooperative fraction as a continuous variable. It's no longer just discrete people. We assume that the population is large enough for that to hold. Um, so we have a few parameters there, the N, the EC, and the mu. And the interesting variable, which we'll see is the, the crucial social variable, is the cooperative fraction of the population. Now, as I was just saying, um, everybody is individually incentivized to over-harvest, so we might expect that everyone just does that and the resource 
suffers as a result, um, as does the social fabric. But we assume that uh, there is a, a norm enforcement strategy here, or a norm enforcement mechanism uh, which counters that temptation. So uh, this is a, a, a social sanctioning mechanism and you can imagine it intuitively as a group of people who are cooperating with the norm, seeing somebody who's defecting and saying, okay, we're no longer going to cooperate with that person. So the defector will experience some punishment. And it depends, that level of punishment experienced by a defector depends on the fraction of cooperators uh, according to the, the Gompertian function that you can see there. So when almost everybody is defecting, you're down here with almost, uh, almost a zero fraction of cooperators. Uh, there's very little punishment that's experienced by each of those defectors because there are hardly any cooperators to sanction them. However, when we reach about 35% cooperativity, there's a, a threshold effect and uh, very rapidly the amount of sanctioning uh, ramps up. Um, and uh, this, this reflects um, social dynamics across a, a range of uh, empirical studies. Uh, and so you, you see there the, the formal uh, representation of the function, it's a, a Gompertz function. <clears throat> we use utility functions to, um, uh, upon which to base the replicated dynamics. And they are, uh, so the, the, the utility, the subjective um, benefit that a cooperator gets from their cooperative strategy, we assume is simply the payoff that they get. It's just the material value that they get from harvesting the resource. The utility that, that the defector gets, we assume to be their payoff minus the punishment that they get from, uh, from the cooperators in the system. And this is the replicator equation. This, this uh, says that at each time step, an agent will choose whether to cooperate or defect in the next time step based on the difference between the payoff that, or the utility that they got in the last time step compared to the average utility in the population. So they look around and they see, okay, actually at the moment the cooperators are doing better than us defectors, so I'm going to switch. Or the defectors are doing better than, than us cooperators, so I'm going to switch. Um, this, this model has also been solved in an agent-based um, implementation. And uh, in the, in the agent-based implementation, people just compare their strategy or their, their utility in the last time step with other people at random in the population and then switch based on uh, who did better in the last time step. This is uh, technically a, a mean field approximation to that kind of discrete strategy comparison. So the dynamics of the social ecological system overall are fairly simply described by two coupled differential equations. Now this looks like a, a bit of a mess, but the, the point here is just to show that we have coupling between the, the, the social and ecological dynamics. The rate of change, the temporal rate of change of the resource at the top you can see depends on phi because the effort is parameterized by phi. And phi depends on ultimately on the resource via the production function, via the payoff. So there is a, there's two-way coupling here. And to get, some, to get a handle on the intuition, we have this causal loop diagram. So let's start with, if we focus on the resource at the bottom, so we, we, we've seen that the more resource there is, the more payoff uh, people get. So the more incentivized they are to defect. So the more resource, the, the greater the defector payoff. But at the same time, um, the defectors have to contend with the social disapproval or sanctioning that they will get from the cooperators. So they have to uh, negotiate that balance, uh, which determines the utility that they will get. And then they decide whether to change strategies or to hold their strategy, which affects the number of cooperators. And the more cooperators there are, the more social disapproval there is, which affects the defector utility. And so on around the cycle. To try to understand um, the, uh, how, how this system plays out, um, of course, one can simulate the dynamics uh, in, in detail, as has been done with agent-based methods. But here we can, con we can consider the, uh, the long-term behavior, the steady-state social ecological dynamics. And uh, as we just saw in the, in the um, causal loop diagram, the crucial balance that determines that steady-state dynamics is the, uh, the ratio of the defector payoff to the sanctioning experience by the defectors. And the, the defector payoff has that form that you see there in the fraction of cooperators. And we see that there's a, an, an overlap, or in fact, two intersections between those two functions. And it turns out those two intersections are the mixed um, fixed points of the social dynamics. So this, um, this figure captures the, the steady state dynamics of the system. And we'll talk through this in a little bit of detail. There are, uh, so you can see there's, there's the, the blue gradient in the background, 
That is a continuum of resource fixed points. So for, for any coordinate on, on that plot, uh, there's, a, there's a resource steady state. On the horizontal axis, again, you have the fraction of cooperators in the system. And on the vertical axis, you have mu. Mu is just a parameter. So there are no dynamics, there are no vertical dynamics. All the dynamics happen horizontally. So on a given run of the model, you would choose some vertical position and then see how the dynamics move horizontally. Uh, whereas there is a continuum of resource fixed points, uh, there are just some loci of social fixed points. And you can see that on the left and on the right, at least at the bottom, there are solid orange lines there. Those are stable fixed points. Those are social equilibria. And then we also see this one curved um, stable or this equilibrium uh, as well. And then there are some, some dashed orange lines which represent the unstable fixed points. So the, the, you can see those, those yellow dots and those will demonstrate some runs of a model. Let's say that we start, um, if we start with about 40% cooperators and the defectors work twice as hard as the cooperators, that is mu is two, uh, then the dynamics runs like that and ends up, we end up in a fully defective state. If instead we start off with 80% cooperators, but the defectors only work about 1.7 times as hard as the cooperators, then we end up in a fully cooperative state. Right? So you see these stable fixed points acting as attractors. If we move up to uh, having the defectors work a little harder, things get particularly interesting now because this is a mixed equilibrium. So the long-term behavior of the system has a uh, stable combination of cooperators and defectors in the population. And if we go uh, right up the top, so we start even with 90% cooperators. In fact, when the defectors work much harder than the cooperators, uh, we return to that stable equilibrium. So I want you to consider <coughs> this image as a benchmark because this is a, a subsystem. This is one social subsystem and one ecological subsystem, and they're interacting. And now we're going to see what happens when we add extra ones and we have weaker interaction between the two. We're going to see how that weaker interaction perturbs this, this behavior. So adding a, an identical adjacent subsystem. Um, and we, crucially, we make the assumption that we have weak biophysical and social couplings between those two systems. So we have this well-formed hierarchy where the dynamics inside each system are much strongly, more strongly coupled than in between the two systems. And we investigate two norm scenarios. So imagine that you live in a, in a village which you know is harvesting some resource and that that same resource is also being harvested by another village over the, over the hill or somewhere nearby, and that their extraction might be affecting the availability of the resource to you and your community, but probably not much. And you don't, your, your community doesn't have much of a social relationship with that other village either, maybe because of a political boundary between the two or some geographical feature which has prevented you from interacting very much. So we have both weak social and biophysical coupling. Now, do you reach out to that other community and, and discuss with them how you will manage the resource collaboratively or don't you? So we consider those two different scenarios. In one case, they manage to overcome their weak social interaction, sit down, discuss, we have this much resource, how much do you have? Okay, so therefore let's agree, all right, we'll only harvest this much if you only harvest that much, uh, so then the resource should be sustainable. And in the other case, they just ignore each other and assume, well, what they do probably doesn't affect us very much. So we call those respectively the collaborative and uncollaborative scenarios, and we'll see that the, re the results are a little different. The system is fully described by four coupled nonlinear differential equations and cannot be analytically solved, but um, we will uh, show you an approximate, an approximate solution. Just want to discuss this idea of resilience because I'm coming from the Stockholm Resilience Center. So uh, there are many definitions of resilience, but a common one is the capacity to absorb perturbations while maintaining structure and function. So that's, that's, we, we will test the resilience of that subsystem to perturbations from large-scale dynamics or long-range dynamics uh, with the neighboring system. Um, so I also want to introduce this idea of bottom-up and, uh, and top-down interactions. So um, we will see in the model that the interactions between the subsystems depend on the behavior within the subsystems. So in that sense, there's, there's bottom-up causation. The, the, the large-scale dynamics depends on the small-scale dynamics. And in turn, the large scale dynamics or the interactions between the systems affect each individual system. So we ask, under what conditions is subsystem one resilient to perturbations from uh, system level dynamics? And how do subsystem interactions affect subsystem one's steady state dynamics? So we use uh, an old workhorse of theoretical physics called perturbation theory. Um, and it's nice to be presenting this at the Henri Poincaré Institute because he was one of the contributors to this theory, er, early theory of uh, 
dynamical systems that can't be analytically solved. And the way this works is just to say, uh, if we know the exact solution to a system which is quite like the one that we are trying to solve but we know we can't solve, we can represent the solution of that unsolvable system as the solution to the one that we do know that we can solve plus some small shift. Right? So we take the system that we've already solved and then we just assume that solution plus a little shift will give us the solution to the new system. And we do that because we assume weak coupling. We've already solved the isolated system, so we solve for that small shift. Find what the shift is at equilibrium, that is the long-term steady state uh, dynamical shift, and then sum those two things together to find the long-term behavior of the perturbed system. And we find the approximation closely agrees with the numerical uh, simulation. Now, we won't go through these mathematical details. Uh, in order to, to, to do this, we non-dimensionalize our variables. We, we include an interaction term between the systems. And that interaction term uh, is, so the, we assume that the resource interaction, the way that the resource moves between these two systems, depends on the resource gradient between the systems. So it's a very simple diffusive interaction. Imagine two buckets of water with a pipe between them. If, one of the, if the water level in one bucket is higher than the other, then the water will flow until they equalize. And you can imagine that if there's also a couple of drinking straws in those buckets and there's two people sucking water out, then the, then the water might flow back and forth depending on the extraction dynamics. So that's, that's how the, the water interaction uh, goes. Um, and we apply perturbation theory in the usual way for those who are familiar. This is what the, uh, the first order perturbative term looks like. So this is the steady state shift in the resource dynamics. And the way to understand this, so you can see two plots. The, the top one shows what happens when subsystem two defects. So that means that um, all of the agents in the, in the system on the right are all defecting. They're all being selfish. So they're extracting more water from the resource, which means there's less water in there. So the water tends to flow in through the, through the resource connection to the other system. So that's why all those numbers that you can see on the contours in the top plot are negative. The, the resource has declined. And the, the converse happens in the bottom plot when subsystem two cooperates. There's more water left over in the resource, uh, so the resource tends to flow the other way, and those, those numbers are all positive. So there's, there's a, an increase in the resource due to the interaction. What about the social interaction dynamics? Well, now we just assume the, the same form for the differential equation. We don't have to do perturbation theory now. But what we do is um, we switch that that um, sanctioning function that you saw before for a two-dimensional sanctioning function because now there's sanctioning between communities as well. So if you uh, consider the plane which is on the right of the surface there, you can see that it has the same shape as that one-dimensional curve. In fact, those two are uh, identical. So um, let's get this laser. So I mean, this, that curve there is identical to this curve. And that's the, that's the sanctioning, ex this surface represents the sanctioning experienced by a subsystem one defector. So a selfish person in subsystem one is being punished mostly by people in their own community, but then they also get weak punishment by people in the neighboring community. These, we assume that these two functions, these two curves here have identical parameterizations. These G's are the same and these T's are the same. But what's different is this, this lambda. And lambda is a, a weak scaling parameter. It just tells you that the effect due to the neighboring subsystem is much weaker than the effect due to the local subsystem. So a local defector experiences a lot of punishment from their cooperative neighbors and a little bit of punishment from the cooperators in the system up the road. Uh, in different regions of the, of the coupling parameter space, that is the social coupling and the uh, biophysical coupling, we see different intersections between the sanctioning plot uh, and the defector payoff. So that means we have different configurations or different combinations of, of equilibria, of social equilibria in this system. So on the left we see that actually there's no intersection at all. So in, in this case there are no mixed equilibria. In the middle we see the kind of situation that I showed you for the isolated subsystem where there are these two intersections. But then because of the influence of the extra community uh, we can have a, a, third, a third intersection down here. So there's a third kind of fixed point that appears in the model when the systems are interacting. And these are, the, these are the results plots from the paper. So I'll, I'll take you through them one at a time. Let's look at the top left here. So this is when, this is when the system is pure. There's only biophysical coupling between the two systems. And what's interesting here is that in the uncollaborative scenario, so that means the two systems said, all right, we're not going to worry about the fact that the other community is, is affecting our, the resource. Uh, 
um, and we're not going to socially, we're not going to sanction them for what they're doing with their resource. In this case, you can get a collapse of cooperation in subsystem one as a result of the interaction between the two systems. And that's because, uh, oh, I, should, I should also clarify here that um, the, we're assuming here that in the, uh, in the long term, subsystem two is fully cooperative. So the neighboring community are, are all playing nicely. And so th essentially they're behaving sustainably. So this tells you that if subsystem two achieves sustainability, it actually prevents subsystem one from achieving sustainability. Why? Well, because when they behave sustainably, they have more resource left over and that increases the temptation for subsystem one to defect because it provides extra resource availability for them. So the neighbors behave well, that leaves more resource available to, to tempt subsystem one, which then finds it in a certain region of the, of the parameter space impossible to resist that temptation and you end up having a collapse of cooperation and a lower resource level. However, in the collaborative scenario, this, this doesn't happen. So this tells you that even when you have only weak social interaction with your neighboring community and when there's only weak resource interaction, um, overcoming that and sitting down with your neighbors and saying, all right, let's, let's manage this resource collaboratively, that drastically changes the outcome of the system from a, collapse of, a, a complete collapse of social cooperation in one community to no collapse at all for, for a certain, in, within a certain parameter subspace. Uh, now, uh, again, we, um, now we, we have two different situations for, the, for a purely social case. Now, we might ask, why would, uh, a community, why would communities that don't share resource, that, that is, they're only socially coupled, why would they punish each other for the way that they harvest uh, their resource, given that what they do with their resource is not going to affect the resources availability for you? Well, in many cases, that probably wouldn't happen, but it's instructive, it's instructive mathematically to, to study these cases. But humans are pretty complicated kinds of creatures. Sometimes we like to punish people for doing things even when they don't affect us. So maybe we have some strong re religious beliefs and we see these people harvesting too much water and we might think, well, that's bad and then we won't cooperate with them, with them anymore even if it doesn't affect the water available to us. So it's not an entirely crazy scenario. Uh, when subsystem two is fully defective, we, we end up with basically, the system dynamics look basically like the isolated case. So if they're behaving selfishly, it doesn't really affect us very much, so we don't care. But um, if they behave well, then there are cooperators available next door to sanction any defectors that are in our subsystem. So that, that reduces the temptation for people in our community to, uh, to over-harvest, and in fact that forces a, a collapse of defection within some, some parts of the parameter space. So having uh, religiously righteous or, or otherwise um, nosy neighbors uh, can help you to manage uh, your resource under certain conditions. So th those are the, the two independent cases of purely biophysical and purely social coupling. What about when they're mixed, right? That's the really interesting case because that's kind of what the real world looks like. Uh, because we non-dimensionalized all our variables, we can compare the effect of the social coupling and the biophysical coupling on equal footings because we're just comparing numerical magnitudes. So we set the, the two interaction strengths to the same level and we show that in fact the social effect overcomes the biophysical effect. So um, whereas in the purely biophysical case we had a collapse of cooperation when all the other parameters are the same but we have um, a moderate level of social and biophysical coupling between the systems, we instead have a collapse of defection. So this, uh, this is kind of a, a happy ending. It tells us that um, if we sit down with our neighbors and collaborate and we make sure that and we keep an eye on them and, and check that they're, um, they're not over harvesting their resource or they're, or they're managing it in accordance to our agreement, in fact, the result is that both systems can end up um, being quite sustainable. So this tells us perhaps an unsurprising story that we need to work together across multiple scales in order to manage our resources effectively. So what I've described to you is uh, a simple but um, still hopefully uh, interestingly detailed network motif model, if you like. It's the simplest possible kind of social e ecological network because we just have two subsystems and they're connected. And of course, you can see how this can be easily extended to much larger network implementations. You can just imagine tessellating this system up to a, an arbitrary number of, uh, of systems, which hopefully will remind you a little bit of the kind of thing that, um, that Jonathan and, and his team were doing. So uh, to, to extend this, we can add those extra subsystems. We can also add extra state variables. We don't have to just have um, levels of norm compliance and uh, one uh, resource variable. We could have a much more complicated system and we could include a, uh, um, 
an institutional layer as, as they have uh, in the model that, that they showed. We can also include extra interaction mechanisms. Remember that the communities produced economic value from the resource that they extracted from the environment. So we could, we could imagine that they might start trading that value with each other somehow. Let's say they're extracting water or they're extracting fish. They might trade that with their neighbors and now we'd have to establish a market, right? There's no market in the model I've just shown you, but if we included one, then we can imagine making this ever more elaborate and including more economics into the, the model. Um, and finally, it would be very interesting to have adaptive topology. So I, uh, for all the network or for all the model runs that I showed you, the social and biophysical couplings were fixed and then we saw how the dynamics played out. Uh, but of course, in real systems, these things are adaptive and the study of adaptive complex networks is, uh, is currently growing very rapidly and seems to be an excellent way of representing these kinds of complex systems in the real world. Uh, now, something that, uh, that, in that interests me from a theoretical perspective is applying more advanced multi-scale analysis methods to these systems. So the perturbation that I showed you is just about the simplest you can do. Um, but there are more advanced methods like singular perturbation theory, which um, is, uh, well, we don't have to go into the details because I don't have time. Um, uh, and also renormalization group methods, which seem to map very well onto these kinds of systems. Those are um, methods that were developed to, uh, well, first in quantum field theory and then for understanding um, phase transitions in uh, condensed matter systems, in statistical mechanical systems. And they describe how large scale macroscopic aggregate variables, um, as, was, as was said over here. So the question was, um, how can we understand how our very large scale model results um, relate to our, to our small, to the small scale microscopic dynamics of the system? Well, that mathematical framework describes precisely that. Um, it's only well formulated for um, a certain range of systems, particularly equilibrium systems, um, but application of that, that technique in complex networks is also coming along. Uh, so I think that's quite promising for the future. And so perhaps there's, there's just one thing I, I want to leave you with here. Um, in, in physics, we have, we, we, uh, there's a fairly intuitive understanding of the relationship between interaction topology and the physical space in which your interacting elements are embedded. And by that I mean, um, imagine uh, an, an Ising model or a couple of magnets interacting with each other. We know that the interaction strength between those magnets depends inversely, monotonically on the separation between them. The further apart they get, the weaker they interact. In social ecological systems and complex systems in general, this is no longer the case. So there are these things called teleconnections. Lots of people are scratching their heads over how to deal with teleconnections. Um, it's possible for communities to have trading partners or um, closely, uh, close social interactions with, with communities on the completely opposite side of the planet. Um, in fact, it's, it's not uncommon in the modern world for these very physically distant systems to be more strongly coupled than neighboring systems. And this, this, is, this completely turns on the head the kind of reasoning that we bring from physics because we all are used to things being more strongly interacting when they're closer to each other. So I think that turning our uh, in inquisition onto this, the uh, relationship between topological space and physical space and really trying to understand that better in these social ecological systems is a, a crucial question for, um, for future work. Now I was going to talk to you about some foundational issues but I have run out of time so I'm just going to skip over all this stuff and get to a summary. <clears throat> All right, so uh, I showed you a, a two-level social ecological system with weak couplings between norm-constrained subsy uh, norm subsystems. Using perturbation theory permitted uh, approximate analytical solution, which was close to the numerics. When you have purely biophysical coupling, that can cause a collapse of cooperation in, in one subsystem. But if you add social coupling, it can overcome that collapse uh, and actually cause collapse of defection. Uh, the model that I showed you was highly extensible to larger network implementations and the use of more advanced multi-scale methods. Um, formal multi-scale, oh, so the summary of the things that I was going to tell you is that um, going into more detail and doing more sophisticated multi-scale modeling in social ecological systems requires a coherent philosophical basis. Um, I have uh, had some spirited conversations, particularly with my social scientist colleagues, because they tend to talk about scale in one way, and people coming from a natural science background tend to talk about scale in another way. And the meaning of terms like scale, level, dimension, measure, and so on are quite different across the um, fields working in this transdisciplinary space. So trying to come to an agreement of a way to think about these things uh, will be, I think, essential for um, more effective modeling in future. And a fundamental challenge uh, will be to understand the interrelations between physical space and topological space because that underpins relations between the scales of, of interactions in the system and its levels of organization.
uh, local community, region, nation, and, and globe. Once again, uh, the details that I presented to you today are summarized in this, in this recently published paper. And if this work piqued your interest, I encourage you to check out these two websites, seslink.org, that's Maya Schluter's group's website, and stockholmresilience.org for the Stockholm Resilience Center. And thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it was nice to have somebody with a physics background, attack social problems. Um, uh, I just want to point out, I mean, the analysis of the specific situation that you discussed was of course, we're very interesting, but, um, uh, you know, um, perturbation theory is not quite the thing. I mean, uh, <laughs> if you had been earlier here in the trimester, we had quite a lot of discussion yeah. about uh, the existence or the non-existence of spectral gaps and uh, of... Uh, fluctuation dissipation, uh, out of equilibrium, and things like that. Yeah. So um, uh, when you talk about, and, and of course in physics you have non-local interactions as well, so that's not specific really, just a social science. So um, it's interesting to bring to bear these things to SES, but uh, we are a little bit further ahead in the physical part of the system. So maybe, you know, it's too bad you could only make it here. <laughs> At the very end, we could have had a more sustained conversation. Sure, I'm gonna right. have to run off pretty soon to submit these two abstracts uh, right. <laughs> for Monday morning at 8 a.m. in San Francisco by 5 p.m. East Coast time. You know? I see, okay. <laughs> well, of, of course, I'd be very interested in, in discussing more. Um, yeah. I, yeah, and, I, and the other thing is that uh, I noticed that I lived for at least a couple of months just a couple hundred meters from where you are, I mean, on Burns Weekend. Oh, yeah? You know, I was a visitor at the uh, Arrhenius Laboratory. At, they have this position of visiting professor, which was originally created by Carl Gustav Rossby, which I <laughs> occupied in 1978, and I was staying at the Benagrin Center. So I used to walk by a lot. You know, when I, when I s saw the picture, I immediately suspected, <laughs> and <laughs> right. I looked it up. Indeed, that's very close, <laughs> yeah. Anyhow, it's a small world. In, thank, you, thank you for your comment, and if, I'd, I'd love to learn more about what you're, what you're doing. Yeah, no, I, I fully acknowledge that this, is, this technique is too simple. It's just meant to be a first stylized step. That's, uh, that's all. Any other questions? Uh, just getting back to your title, so it was cross-scale, what was interactions. Um, so by scales here, you meant really that you have neighbors. Mm -hmm. And that's they can have different behavior, so different they can be defenders while you're cooperator. So that's that's the main issue when you call well, main definition of scale as you call it here. Just to understand. Uh, right. So uh, <coughs> the the more foundational part of the talk was going to deal with precisely that question. So mm -hmm. um, formally, the scales in in the model are mm -hmm. the uh, strengths of interactions, the, the the interaction couplings between the processes within the subsystem versus between the subsystems. Mm -hmm. um, and we we're assuming here mm -hmm. um, the yeah, okay. w whereas uh, I mean there's there's no pr there's no spatiotemporal parameterization of those parameters in this model. We just say Let's assume that we're interacting more weakly with our neighbors than we are with our, with our distant neighbors than with our local neighbors. Mm. Um, but whether or not that assumption makes sense is quite contentious because of these so-called teleconnections. You can have very mm. strong relationships with communities that are far away. Okay. Uh, yeah, so the scales here are the interaction strength parameters or the couplings. Um, in, in most physical systems, we would assume that that correlates well to the spatial separation between systems, but it doesn't have to in, in SAS. Okay. Yeah, and when one of, on one of your plots, when you show manifolds, equilibrium, mm. so I understand that phi is on the x-axis, but you never show uh, what is on y-axis. So just uh, what was there. <coughs> on the y-axis? Yes. 
Uh, so which, which plot do you mean? Uh, I mean a, a manifold or equilibrium plots. Uh, yeah, so on the y-axis is, is mu. It's the ratio of the oh, cooperator okay. effort to the defector effort. Sorry, I so thought, the, I, I, thought yeah. I explained that, at least in the, in the first one. No, no, that's... On okay, here we go. Yeah. So on, on the y-axis there, you can see the mu. So that's the ratio of how hard the defectors right, work. Right, but on the left side, I never seen... The, the mu, yeah, that's... Oh, I see, okay. Well, I'm, yeah, sorry about that, but it's just, <coughs> just the parameter. There's no dynamics the happening up and down. It's all horizontal. So it's a ratio. And then, of course, the equilibria are on the crossing of these two manifolds, right? So that's... Sorry? The equilibria are on the crossing of these uh, pink and brown curves, right? Are on the what of the brown? On the intersection. So you have three points. So the, right. the, the equilibrium... Uh, the, the loci that you see, the dashed, the, the orange loci, those are the social equilibria. Um, mm. And mm. so the, yes, the system will always settle on one of those so, of stable social equilibria and the resource level that corresponds to that equilibrium is mm -hmm. the value of the resource, equilibrium resource manifold that sits underneath the curve. Okay. Yes. Well, if, yeah. So, yeah, just, um, Maybe just just as a brief comment, uh, also relating to what what Michael said, and, and to your comment on on understanding these uh, social complex social ecological systems more, um, I think that there's just you 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 nicely showed how um, how there's so much room for for uh, applying uh, mathematical methods that have been developed in other fields to now these types of systems because this the, the mathematical treatment of these systems is just underdeveloped for different reasons. I think mainly it's kind of the, the type of people who have worked on this are, typically don't have a very strong mathematical background and so it just shows a lot of potential, right? And this is just, a, I think it's a, an encouragement for everyone to look into this more. This is how I see it at least. I agree, I see it that way too. <laughs> okay, yeah. I think that's the end uh, for, the, for your talk. Thank you again, Andrew. Okay. Thank you. Um,